Good evening, everyone. We'll be getting started in just a moment. We're going to wait a minute and let everyone join. See, we still have people joining us. We'll just give it another moment. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because we do have a bit of a lengthy intro um, for this program. So good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight for the Hudson Library special virtual event. Tonight, I am pleased to introduce tonight's speakers, Matt Johnson and Tessa Masajek. I wanna make sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Authors of the new book, Branding That Means Business. Tonight's program kicks off our annual fall entrepreneurship series at the library, and we have an exciting lineup of fun and educational programs for entrepreneurs and businesses of all sizes. On Wednesday, Candace Nelson, the founder of Sprinkles Cupcakes, you know, the bakery with the world-renowned cupcake ATM, will be joining us to talk about how to take your passion and turn it into a viable business plan. We'll also welcome a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Gary Rivlin, who will discuss his new book, Saving Main Street, which analyzes the issues facing small businesses today and documents the challenges faced by several small businesses in Pennsylvania during the onset of COVID-19. For more information or to register for any of our programs, just visit our website, hudsonlibrary.org. We do encourage everyone watching tonight to please submit your questions about branding to our experts. They are truly experts, really. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and we will get through as many questions as time permits. Also, copies of Branding That Means Business are available for purchase, courtesy of Hudson's own independent bookstore, The Learned Owl, and we're going to put a link in the chat for easy purchase. Now, I would like to introduce tonight's guest. First, Dr. Matt Johnson is a researcher, writer, and professor at Holt International Business School in San Francisco. He is a writer for Psychology Today and a regular contributor to Forbes, BBC, and Business Insider. Much of his research and writing is related to applying the work of neuroscientific perspectives to better understand consumer experience and decision making, along with topics related to the human side of business. So a lot of that intersection of psychology and marketing and business. Dr. Tessa Mashaznik, so sorry, a professor at Hull International Business School, and specializes in developing human capital strategies to improve business communications. Previously, she was the CEO of Empathetics Incorporated, a company that developed empathetic communication training for healthcare professionals. So Matt and Tessa, I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening to discuss the principles behind your new book. Thanks so much for having us, Kelsey. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So as we talked a little bit in the green room before we went live, I know we have a lot of very small business owners that are watching tonight. And so I want to make sure our, our conversation is geared, especially for the small business. And I was captivated in the beginning of your book, in your introduction, you quote, you say branding, the branding world finds itself at a crossroads. Can you give a little bit of insight into what that means and what type of crossroads are we at? Sure. So from the standpoint of, of the consumer, we're spoiled, essentially. We're, we're spoiled for choice. Um, any song that's ever been recorded, we can have at you know, the press of a few buttons or just a shout to our smart speaker. Um, you know, any product you could imagine can be delivered to you within a few hours, probably, uh, via Amazon Prime with, again, just sort of a shout to the smart speaker. Um, there's really been this frictionless experience that capitalizes on the immediate gratification of consumers. And so from a product value standpoint, in terms of getting products that deliver immediate value to consumers, uh, it, it's never been easier. Um, the difficult thing then is for brands, especially younger brands that are existing outside of this big competitive ecosystem and these big competitive platforms to really crack into this. And so what we describe in the book is that essentially from now moving forward, there are no B minus brands. Either you are excellent and you're beloved and you're actively sought out or you are noise. So unless you actively seek out that you want, let's say Duracell batteries, um, if you shout out, hey, order me some batteries to Amazon Alexa, 
It's going to default to you're entering another brand's ecosystem. You're entering Amazon's ecosystem. They're going to send you whatever batteries is best for Amazon's business, which is going to deliver them the best uh, profit margin. And uh, it's probably going to be their Amazon Basics proprietary brand. Um, and so to crack into this, the brand really needs to stand out. And so I think that presents a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities, because as we described in the book, the brand can deliver unique value that simple products can't. And so I think this is really the, the crossroads that um, brands, especially small businesses, um, really find themselves in today. And so when you're talking about the proliferation of commodities at this point, and that you really need to be able to stand out from all of the noise, you know, has branding always really been a necessity for a business thinking historically, um, you know, or is it now more of a modern um, concept with businesses and marketing that the brand is really essential? Um, so Kelsey, I think that's a really interesting question, um, primarily because marketing has seen a huge evolution over the past 20 years uh, from being in a place where mass marketing and mass media marketing, where your primary marketing channels were TV, radio, print, uh, were the ways in which people communicated about brands. And you didn't necessarily as a brand need to be as targeted uh, the way that you do today to try to break through the noise of social media and, and the thousands of different communication channels that people have access to today. So for instance, you know, soap opera's got the name soap opera because of laundry detergent, which was advertising uh, during the day when they knew that, um, you know, women who were primarily women who were at home doing house chores uh, and doing laundry would be watching television. And so that was about the extent of the, the targeting then. But what we've seen and what Matt just referred to with the pro proliferation of, of products through these this kind of platform economy that we've moved towards, We've seen that the necessity of brand has become um, has become different in the context of the consumer. So today, not just because of all of the different communication channels that people have access to, from social media to um, their AI assistant Siri, Alexa, you name it, um, but they also have uh, brands really need to connect to the consumer in a way that's incredibly targeted that will create meaning for the consumer that allows the consumer to really develop an emotional attachment. And that's the way that brands can, can really break through this noise and develop this sense of loyalty on behalf of the consumer. And so what we're seeing today is brands have taken on a different meaning rather than being um, the kinds of advertisements that were colorful and loud and maybe had a memorable uh, you know, uh, jingle to them. Today, they have to tell a story. They have to create more meaning because that's the way they can break through all of this noise and really connect to people through these different types of marketing channels that people are accessing today. Um, however, I think it's a real fantastic opportunity for especially small businesses to recognize that if they're able to develop a powerful, meaningful brand uh, for the consumers that or the business owners, whether it's a B2C or B2B context, that they can, they can better connect, that they can have that, create a brand experience that creates that emotional connection with their customer. And I think it's a real opportunity to differentiate from the products and services you would see on, on big platforms like Amazon. Absolutely. And so I want to, because we've been using the word brand a lot here in the, last, the first 10 minutes, I want to take a step back because maybe for some people in the audience tonight, they're thinking, well, I have a website. Um, I have a social media page. Maybe I even have a logo and I use the same colors on everything. I have a brand. Is that a brand or is there something more when we are saying a brand? So, so we can really define a brand as the totality of the emotional and semantic associations that a consumer base has with them. So uh, brands are, are inherently idiosyncratic. So if you imagine you know, any brand you can think of, whether it's Lululemon or Nike or Amazon, uh, every individual is gonna have a different, slightly different set of emotional associations and semantic associations that come to mind. But nonetheless, there's gonna be some generalizability there. If you ask enough people, you can sort of aggregate this. And if you were to aggregate this and get sort of the, the median set of associations, uh, both emotionally and semantic, you get what's called the brand image. 
And that's really what brands are striving for. Uh, so what you described before in terms of, of the logo and the website, I mean, these are assets of the brand. Uh, these are in, in some ways tools of the brand, which enables them to really go about the core purposes of the brand, which is to differentiate it from its competitors, to identify its offerings and to add unique value above and beyond what the product delivers. So if you think about the company, the company is essentially a, a financial and legal entity. The company is not the brand. The company creates the brand, which is a tool that enables it to accomplish these things. So you can talk about brand at sort of a, a, a number of different levels. Ultimately, it's a set of associations that consumers have with it, and it helps uh, the company accomplish these core goals. And really what we argue for in the book is that you can do branding really on you know, any given level. So you can have a brand that has a set of associations and it's just, you know, it's decent, it's fine. It's, hey, this is a decent brand. I know it, it's trustworthy and that's branding and it's fine and it serves some of these purposes. But really, as we mentioned before, the threshold has been raised. There's no such thing as B minus brand. It's really easy to have the sort of superficial level of, of branding really for brands to go above and beyond and really help differentiate for their companies, they really have to tap into these sort of deeper, more emotional qualities. And so maybe we'll get to that sort of a little bit later on as sort of how brands can, can sort of enable these sort of deeper connections, but that's how we would define brands in, in this context. Right. And so when we're talking about these deeper emotional qualities, and I understand that the brand is not necessarily the company and vice versa. However, um, Tessa, I believe I read recently a research uh, report that you had released that actually argues that the em employees should play a role when developing a brand. Am I correct? Absolutely. So if you think about defining a brand, you can define it by your logo, your motto, the color, your color palette on your website and so forth. But you really want to think about your brand in the context of every touch point that your customer has with your business that it, they should feel the essence of the brand. So however you define that, we talk a lot about um, things like brand purpose, like what does your brand stand for? And it really should link to what does your company stand for? Why are you here? Why are you existing? And what kind of an impact do you wanna make, not just perhaps on your customer, but perhaps on your community? And, uh, and so what you wanna think about is how is that being operationalized throughout your entire company? So. Well, what we advise and what the research I've done in the past couple of years in particular has been really looking at workplace culture and how does that intersect with marketing and brands? Because again, we've seen the walls of what we call information asymmetry, that wall that companies used to have that kind of shielded any sort of um, information being kind of leaked out to the public about the way they operated internally. Today, that's that's gone, right? With the internet, with investigative, investigative reporting, and really with a bunch of savvy teenagers, they can pretty much find out anything they need to know about a company. And so if you're not actually being uh, transparent and operationalizing what your brand stands for throughout your company, getting your employees engaged with what, what that brand stands for so that when they interact with customers, they are exuding that promise of the brand, um, then it's, you're gonna be seen as inauthentic. And that's probably one of the worst things that can happen, especially for small businesses, is that people will not believe you, they'll, they'll lose trust in you because they'll see you saying one thing and acting another way. So it's really important to think about how do you get your you know, internal organization bought into and really feeling what you want your brand to stand for. And then you think about how do we now deliver that experience to the customer? So if a company has already developed a brand before thinking about their employees and their role in the brand, is there anything you can do to like backtrack and get the employees on board? Or is it once you're already down this one-way street, they're kind of left behind? It can be a challenge for sure. Um, you know, if we're sort of building a brand from scratch, we can be availed of, of all of these modern principles. We can build that brand from scratch. We can set our brand goals our strategy about sort of who we're serving and then set up a, a sort of a series of tactics to be able to execute on that. Um, brands, because they are uh, effectively these sets of associations uh, can sort of suffer from inertia. There's always this existing perception of them 
and they need to act in a way that's consistent with that. And uh, to a certain extent, they have a difficult time sort of maneuvering. It's like, you know, move, maneuvering the, uh, the Titanic or really, really, you know, heavy, heavy vessel. Um, and it can be it can be a challenge for sure. I think there's certain ways and, and Tessa can certainly speak to this and the work that she's doing uh, of really operationalizing the brand in terms of how it's being felt internally and how that can be um, more authentically communicated to consumers. So one of my, my favorite examples of this comes from the brand Converse, which is uh, headquartered right here in Boston. And uh, this was uh, when uh, Jeff Cottrell, the CMO, who's now the CMO of Coca-Cola, he was the CMO of uh, Converse, and he was very sort of human centric, and he was very sort of against all this performance marketing and very against the metrics. And it was really about, hey, if we just put our consumers sort of front and center of what we do, if we create a brand and create an experience that serves their needs and touches them in their lives and in terms of their helps them be the best they can possibly be, um, you know, we're doing our job and the rest will follow. And one beautiful way that he was able to operationalize that sort of internally and have that exude outward sort of like concentric circles is that every at every executive meeting that he had so it was like the cmo the coo the ceo and some other sort of executive of the company he would always leave a chair open for the consumer and he would sort of rail on this point that if you know our, our core consumer which at the time for their specific product category was like a 16 year old sort of punk rock girl that was sort of the target market for for converses and if that 16 year old girl heard us talking in this way. And that's how she found out that these are these conversations, the brand is happening, this company that she loves is happening. Would she ever buy from us ever again? And that's what we need to be thinking about. So having these employee practices, workplace culture, really um, not only walk the walk, but also talk the talk and really have that be operationalized from the inside out. And as, as Tessa mentioned, uh, gone are the days of a brand that used to have this really safe distance between them and the rest of the world. Uh, used to be that brands could sort of, you know, they'd buy that 7 p.m. slot on, uh, on television and they could sort of unilaterally dictate uh, what their brand image is and what they stand for. And it used to be that uh, the brand got to tell consumers uh, what the brand image is. But now more than ever, consumers tell each other what the brand image is and that uh, it includes other consumers, it includes word of mouth, but especially for large corporations with massive headcount, that also includes the employees as well. Um, wh what would you add to that, Tessa? Oh, I, I think that's, I think that sums it up perfectly. <laughs> that was very detailed, absolutely. Um, and that's actually a really great story about Converse. I'm actually in a pair right now, I pretty much live in those shoes. So. <laughs> um, but you know, that is true what you're saying is with everything, especially with the proliferation of social media and how we shop and consume and review things that, you know, you as a company, you might have a vision for your brand, but the reality is, is you don't get to dictate the brand, that there has to be a little bit of, probably honestly, a lot of flexibility in terms of how the public reacts and also shapes the brand itself. Now, for the control freak that might be in the audience, is there any way for an organization to take part in that interpretation process with the consumer? Yeah, so I, I think that this um, that's a great point because I, as someone who's uh, taught entrepreneurship and been an entrepreneur myself, I really love the work of Clayton Christensen and other greats um, who have looked at you know, not just why are you developing a product or service? And oftentimes entrepreneurs and founders will think about, oh, I'm developing a product or service because I wanted to do X. But what they quickly might find out is that once you put it into the marketplace, the customer will decide what job they need done and may see your product or service in a totally different way to do a totally different job. And in those particular instances, Clayton Christian would, Christensen would advise entrepreneurs to say, thank you. <laughs> not try to fix the consumer or the customer to try to get them to see it their way, but to say, oh, great, you see value in my product or service. I've got to pivot my marketing strategy so I can start to position my product. And maybe I have a totally different set of competitors because of the job that you're finding my product can do for you. So I need to kind of rethink about the way I'm positioning my product or service. So part of it is that iterative process as an entrepreneur of, 
going out with your, your product or service and really, you know, not just kind of putting out there and waiting to see if you get sales, but really listening to the, the customer at every step of the way and doing, you know, continuous market research to really understand how is your product or service being perceived by the customer? How are they using it? And then being able to go back and, and continue to iterate the product or the service so that you're finding that place where it's really a co-creation pro uh, process with the customer to be able to develop the product or service and to the brand so that the brand has the most meaning uh, for the customer. Again, I think we see lots of very famous entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs or Richard Branson that as founders of companies, they put a lot of themselves into their brand and their brand almost becomes synonymous with their personalities. But when we think about what a brand is and we talk about this in the book is a brand has a personality as well. And it's a very human quality that a brand takes on and people really develop this level of loyalty and this emotional connection to the brands because of the way it might uh, provide value to them. So as a business owner, you want to really be able to actively assess that and listen to your customers continuously to see how that's evolving over time. I think if, if I may just add to that, Kelsey, I think, mm -hmm. you know, one sort of classic conception of a brand strategy is um, sort of having this, you know, nice, neat sort of box and arrow diagram of how value is delivered to the consumer. So brand strategy is really the what and the who. It's sort of what we deliver, the value we deliver and who we deliver it for. And that is, you know, an absolutely essential equation. Like that is the core framework for brand strategy, but it's important to think about that as a general heuristic, but not as a uh, something that needs to be all binding and, and very sort of strictly uh, adhered to. Because once a product is out there, especially in uh, sort of the messy world, especially in, uh, you know, the meme culture of social media, where things take on, you know, secondary, tertiary iterations and different interpretations, uh, we have to be flexible as brand managers, especially small businesses, in terms of how our, our products and our messages and ultimately our brands are being perceived by different parties. And I think uh, the more we can sort of lean into a little bit of, of flexibility, really the, uh, the better off we can be. Because uh, brands can have multiple entry points. So if you even think of, uh, of really massive brands like a Tesla, for example, uh, so some people buy Tesla because they're just, you know, Elon Musk super fans. And like, that's the entry point for the Tesla brand and whatever, you know, whatever Elon Musk puts out on wheels, they're going to buy it. Um, other people come in because they don't really care for Elon Musk. They think he's kind of a, you know, whatever. Uh, but, you know, they're really in it for the environment. That really speaks to their values. And this is an innovative brand that, that's, that's sort of pushing the dial there. Other people because it's just cool and stylish and it's, it's, a, it's a differentiated luxury product. And so a brand can be successful and be all these things at once. Chanel is another great example that we talk about in the book that uh, to some of its consumer base is very austere and very classic and very refined, but they do uh, brand communication that sort of shows their more sort of whimsical style. And you'll see ad copy that looks like we're out of a, uh, like a Wes Anderson movie and sort of speaks to sort of the childlike whim of, uh, of consumers' lives. And so it's, it's totally fine for brands, even established brands, to have these multiple entry points. So it's understand it's important for brands to sort of understand itself internally, what its capabilities are, what it stands for, but also be be flexible about its how it's being interpreted and, and how that value is being received. Well, yeah, absolutely, that makes sense to me because you know, coming as a librarian here, we have different user groups, different target communities, right? We have parents, we have seniors, we have just adults that need a workspace. And you can't be everything to everybody, but each person interprets what the library means to them in a very different way, whether we're helping with literacy and early childhood development, or we're help, or they interpret us because, you know, we provide a quiet place from the work each day. So that also has to go in hand in hand with really knowing who your audience and your customer base is too, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And obviously in today's environment, it's been this way, it's nothing new. We need, we should know that more than ever of uh, due to the Amazonification of the world. Um, and I think it is important that, you know, we do have to talk about the giant in the room and it's obviously not the only one, but in your opinion, how has Amazon just completely upended the business world and branding? 
So it's it's been a total a total game changer. So in the book, we use this analogy of the KT extinction. That if we're to think back on, uh, you know, what of humanity's most important events, you know, we might think about the invention of fire. If we go even earlier, uh, you know, uh, you know, bipedal movement, etc. Uh, but um, you know, I think one of the most important events really is the KT, KT extinction. So you know, this big Manhattan-sized asteroid hits in modern-day Yucatan. You know, destroys 90% of, of plant and animal life, and there, there's something very similar happening in the business world. And it's you know, to keep this analogy going, it uh, was sort of a slow-building asteroid, so it didn't sort of hit all at once. But I think if we could pick, you know, a certain year which really uh, was sort of the central point of this would be 2007. So in 2007, this is when Amazon started the Kindle and really sort of disrupted uh, not only bookstores, but how people access books and experience books. This is when Apple launched the iPhone. This is when Twitter uh, began. This is when Facebook uh, started going beyond uh, college campuses. This was really a pivotal year in technology. It's also when uh, Google launched Gmail, which was was a humble, you know, Gmail uh, email app at the time, but now is the most popular uh, email account in the world. So it's really 2007 that these, you know, massive companies became extremely successful. Went on these massive trajectories, became not only successful businesses and brands, but also platforms. And so that's sort of the, the key sort of understanding here. They each became their own sort of mini monopolies in terms of how consumers access goods. So Amazon is not just a successful e-commerce company, they really control how consumers access products. You know, Google is not just a, you know, a fantastic search, but they really help, it's really the, the gateway to the internet. You could think of Apple really being the guardians to mobile technology, especially for uh, younger consumers. And so we have now this sort of state we're at with competitive infrastructure. And we can actually take some lessons, I think, from uh, bookstores, which for Amazon, which sort of led this, this asteroid, this massive KT extinction, uh, really what they caused the extinction for were, of course, bookstores. Um, so they, you know, that was their first sort of focus. They went into physical retail much more generally, of course. But that was their initial product, and they absolutely demolished the bookstore. And so that is, uh, you know, a, a very sad event in and of itself. But when we look back and sort of rewind the tape, it wasn't all bookstores. Uh, the bookstores that survived and arguably have even thrived in the post-Amazon era are the bookstores that went above and beyond. They went above and beyond the book. Uh, you know, before 2007, there was a bunch of, quite frankly, mediocre bookstores. And these mediocre bookstores were competing on product. The bookstore said, I can give you a book. Amazon said, Amazon said, I can give you a book. And Amazon is going to give you that book better, faster, more efficiently, wider selection. If you're competing on product, Amazon is going to win each and every time. So if you're just delivering a book, then Amazon is going to beat you. So it was those bookstores that really got demolished. And the ones that survived and thrived went beyond that. Uh, so in the book, we talk about this wonderful bookstore in Tokyo that uh, the focus is on literally a single book. Uh, they're still around today. They focus on a single book and they'll rotate for a month, uh, one book each. They have thousands of copies of that one book. The author themselves will, will come by and, and sort of, you know, talk to audiences. The, the, the ambience of the bookstore is sort of set up to reflect that book. It's really a homage to the book and try getting that type of, of uh, really enriching, uh, intense experience around a single book from Amazon. So Amazon can't compete there. So they're going into a different dimension. Uh, same with uh, Daunt Books in the UK, which has been incredibly successful in the post-Amazon era. And the, uh, the, the founder, James Daunt, went on to uh, pioneer Waterstones in the UK, which has been equally uh, successful. He went on kind of uh, ironically to be the CEO of Barnes & Noble. They're trying to bring that back. But you go into a Daunt Books, I mean, it's like a chapel. It's like a church dedicated to books. I mean, it's amazing for people that love books and love that feel of being in a bookstore. Uh, Daunt Books is for you. So they're able to provide something to the consumer that Amazon can't. Um, so they went beyond the book. And that's really a lesson, not just for bookstore owners, but really for everybody operating in, in physical retail with a physical product. But if you're competing on product value, chances are Amazon is going to be able to deliver more efficiently. And so it's really about going beyond the sort of raw utility. Uh, and this is an area, a dimension that, uh, that Amazon can't, can't compete on. And that is really where I think the, the strategy lies.
Right, because when I think about some of the local bookstores in Northeast Ohio, many of them quickly, I was in college and at Kent State and we had some bookstores in Kent State as well. The ones that were just trying to sell books completely folded before I was even graduated. But the one in Kent that really thrived um, and even has expanded since like they became a live music venue, a coffee shop, like they really try to make a sense of community. Um, and that element of community is something you can't find on Amazon. So, Absolutely. I was going to say, Kelsey, to that point, I think the example that you just highlighted is that that it sounded like that bookstore had a strong purpose. So, you know, kind of to the same extent in the chapter where we talk about the KT extinction being, uh, you know, Amazon being compared to the KT extinction, we really talk about brand purpose as being kind of the soul and the warm bloodedness of the human experience, right? So in that, in that example, what I would probably um, venture to guess is that the purpose of that bookstore was to bring a sense of community to that area and that they saw their purpose as developing, you know, opportunities for community to come together to celebrate music, to celebrate books, to literature and so forth. And so for small companies who are thinking about how do we compete, it's when you think about your brand, it's really around, you know, what's our purpose beyond developing a, a revenue generating product that's going to bring us profit and allow me to make a living. Um, what else do I want my brand to stand for? What purpose do I want to have within the community that I'm serving so that people feel, again, that more emotional connection to the, to the brand? Right, absolutely. And as you're saying, how can I compete? I think this brings in a really important topic you talk about in your book. Um, and it goes a little bit different than what I've heard other uh, marketers um, and business experts say. So I love to hear your take about this. You know, a lot of companies opt for that, you know, buy five, get one free loyalty card or get our app. And, you know, the more you buy on our app, we'll, we'll give you a percentage off or that lucky email where you might um, have that serendipitous um, percentage off or something like that. Loyalty programs. Um, you, in your book, you kind of argue that loyalty programs are not necessarily um, the best function when building a brand, correct? To, uh, to compete against the Amazon. Can you explain why you have your stance on loyalty programs and what instead would be something, is there some a replacement yeah, so as it relates to loyalty programs, you know, when you have uh, four bagel shops in your town and every bagel shop offers the same loyalty program of buy nine bagels and get the 10th one free, you start to wonder, well, what's differentiating about that? How is that driving loyalty? Maybe I'll just shop all four or five bagel shops and eventually get five free bagels, right? So when you, we also make the comparison, we cite the example of airlines. Airlines have very common loyalty programs where if you generate so many millions of miles, you became, you are able to use your mileage to buy tickets, to enter into the, the first class lounge when you go to certain airports. So you get the same, the loyalty programs look the same to everyone. What we saw in some examples that we discussed in the book is that companies, and using the airline example uh, a little bit further, what some new entrants into the market started to realize was that if everyone's doing the same thing, then that's not really differentiating. They're really creating this kind of uh, similar market experience for everyone. But if I am JetBlue and I'm going to come in and develop the greatest customer experience knowing that the number one complaint that uh, customers have on airlines is that the customer service is terrible. <laughs> I'm going to create the airline that has the absolute best customer service. Similar to Southwest, I'm going to create the airline that goes to different, different uh, airports, small, more local airports that really caters to the business traveler. Then you're starting to create reasons why uh, a customer would actually choose your business over another's business. And it becomes less about the flashy loyalty program and it becomes more about the way in which you're serving the customer in a way that's meaningful to them. And so what we have learned about brand loyalty is that it's really important to the marketing function because if you have brand loyal customers, then everything else about your marketing strategy is going to be better, right? You're going to be able to probably price a little bit higher. When you have promotions, they're going to be really successful. People will, uh, you know, in the case of a pandemic, they will seek out your product and probably stock up on it if they think they won't be able to get it for a while. 
that's the kind of behavior you see from truly loyal customers. Really what you want to think about in, in being able to develop that level of loyalty is how am I being different from my competitors in order to better meet the needs of my customer and better connect with them. And, and again, it comes back to that, that purpose of what is it that they're connecting to and, and how am I delivering a greater value to that customer? What is the purpose which I'm serving that really will allow them to choose my business over the business down the street that's, that's you know, serving a similar product that I am. And so when you're able to really connect into that kind of why behind a customer would become loyal to you and, and what is that emotional connection, then you're able to create true loyalty that's not going to be dependent on a loyalty card or, or a mileage program, but that they're choosing you because you uh, are really meeting their needs, that you're really delivering value in a differentiated, a differentiated way. That makes absolute sense. Another thing too, I would think is it would get watered down because if everyone's doing loyalty programs, I mean, my wallet can only hold so many loyalty cards or things like that, you know? Um, and I would just think that people will end up forgetting about it anyway. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. They're, they're not very differentiated and essentially it, it's all effectively the same thing. There's nothing proprietary about these programs. You can't own, you know, buy nine sandwiches, get the 10th one free, every sandwich shop is doing it. And so it, it becomes commodified. It becomes just, uh, you know, this is what the standard uh, for, for buying a sandwich. And so as, as Tessa mentioned, you know, it's really some of the, the best and, and sort of brands that people are most loyal to uh, don't have any formal loyalty programs at all. If you think JetBlue or Southwest Airlines or uh, Trader Joe's, which in an in a industry groceries where, uh, you know, loyalty programs are so common, you know, here, scan your card and get 10% off or scan your card and get your, uh, you know, it, it's some sort of perk. Trader Joe's does absolutely nothing. And yet they have a, a fantastically loyal base. And what a lot of these brands do that are able to incur really natural organic loyalty is they really tap into our social psychology naturally with their brand personality. And they uh, tend to optimize something that's very prioritized in social psychology, which is perceived warmth. There's a lot of research on this. This comes from the lab of, of Susan Fisk, who was one of my graduate advisors uh, in, in graduate school. And she's done this, she's done this excellent work where, uh, of course, all dimensions of, of the human psyche are important and all you know, elements of personality have their place, but there's certain elements which are more important than others. And when we're assessing somebody for the first time, we're looking at them across these two dimensions. The first is warmth. Does this person intend to do me harm or do they intend to do me, uh, do, they, do they have good intentions for me? And the second is confidence. Do they have the ability to execute on these intentions or not? And when you look even closer at like a millisecond level, warmth is actually processed a little bit earlier. So she has this great research with Alex Todorov, another one of uh, my graduate advisors, uh, who's found that within like 200 milliseconds, so just like a snap of a finger, you already are assessing people for warmth. So it's a very, very important, highly prioritized uh, personality trait. And it's the same for brands. We're really sort of sensitive towards brands which have positive perceived intentions. It's in this excellent work where she looked at sort of perceived warmth and confidence of all of these multinational global brands and sort of charted them in terms of warmth and competence. And when you look at sort of high warmth, high competence brands, this is where you get like a Hershey's chocolate or Coca-Cola, or you get Lululemon, or all of these incredibly beloved brands. And so a lot of these brands, Southwest uh, very much included, were able to exude warmth. And what that really means is you have the intentions of the consumer uh, at sort of every, every customer touch point. So uh, you sort of feel this, this sort of positivity at all times as a consumer. And that really leads to this much more organic and much more enduring sense of loyalty, which again, goes above and beyond any sort of you know, transactional dynamics that, that comes with these loyalty programs. I'm kind of glad that you brought into the psychology a little bit due to your background, because I do want to touch a little bit before we go on more practical questions for the person who's like, I don't know, you're talking about brands, but what do I actually really start doing? Um, you know, there's so much research into the relationships of human psychology and marketing in general. There always has been like how advertising can affect people and their decisions and things like that. But I'm really curious to know from you, like, how do brands really influence like our psychology on both an individual level, but also like as a collective, like as our society. 
So yeah, definitely on an, on an individual level, brands do have all of these pretty incredible sort of top-down effects on the consumer. Uh, so as we discussed, the brand is really a, uh, a constellation of, of temporal and uh, sort of emotional associations. And these have sort of a deep impact on, for example, our raw perceptual experience. So there's literally hundreds, I don't know if we have any wine drinkers in the audience, but there's literally hundreds of experiments suggesting that if a wine is purported to be from a uh, really esteemed winery, an esteemed brand in the winery industry, it'll taste significantly better, despite the fact it may actually be totally cheap, you know, not very esteemed wine, but if, you're led to believe it comes from an incredible brand, it'll actually have all these pretty incredible top-down influences. Uh, there was a great experiment by Baba Shiv, a, a colleague of mine at, at Stanford, uh, where he gave people a simple wine tasting exercise. It was wine poured from the same glass, two different groups of people. In one uh, group, they were told it was $300 wine. In the other group, they were told it was $30 wine. But in actuality, it's the same exact wine. And so people in a $300 wine reported that it tasted better. So we sort of replicate these sort of general findings. But if we look at the neural data, we see that there's increased activation in a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens is essentially our brain's pleasure center. So we know a lot about how the brain represents pleasure um, by looking at people that have uh, sort of deep brain electrode stimulation during surgery. So if somebody's receiving surgery and they're anesthetized, you can actually do stimulation on the brain in different parts and sort of see how that impacts their mental faculties. So if you do, uh, for example, stimulation on the uh, occipital cortex in the back of the brain, that's sort of our, our visual centers and we'll have visual hallucinations. If you do this over uh, linguistic parts of the brain, people will sort of babble. If you do this on the nucleus accumbens, you'll get reports such as, whatever you're doing, doctor, just don't stop. This feels like the best moment of my life. This feels like I'm watching a thousand sunsets. This feels like I'm eating a thousand chocolate bars. Like this is amazing. And that's the part of the brain that's activated at the mere suggestion that a given wine is more expensive than it actually is. And so the brand really controls these associations and has these sort of incredible sort of top-down effects. That's really powerful. And I can, um, I know you have a lot of different examples too about the power of both, I would argue commodities and brands um, and how it can really shape your culture and your book. We don't have to go into them all tonight, but like the cheap wedding to me, I'm not really sure if I would ever um, have a wedding with just a bunch of Jeeps around, um, but there are people that do. So it is a very powerful thing. Um, we'll go ahead and move into some more practical questions. And we already have some audience questions coming in too. Um, so let's see for like the really small business, like these people don't even have a marketing department. Maybe they just have like a couple people on their team and that's it. What steps would you um, recommend when you take to develop a brand um, as the initial onset? Like what would be your first things, um, especially if time and um, cost um, are factors? Yeah, so I mean, as as we talk about in the book, um, so we use an analogy of a home and a house um, that when you think about building a brand, that there are some kind of essentials you have to do as far as similar to building a house. You need the lumber, you need to find the location, you need the lumber, you need to the architecture to, to build the house. But as we know, uh, for many people out there who, who have own their own homes or have a, have a house that they live in, that it doesn't really become yours until you start to put your own kind of design into it, right? Until you start to fill it with furniture and, and start to make it your own, hang your pictures on the wall and really start to fill it with memories that, that you as, a, as the homeowner, as a person who's there can make it feel like it's part of them. And so brand is very similar. As far as you know, being able to establish a brand, there's that basic architecture of understanding things like the brand identity, what goes into you know, the, our look and feel of the brand, how are we going to be recognized, what's our logo, what's our color palette, those kind of uh, uh, identity items that you talked about at the very beginning of, of the call. But very quickly, you do want to think about, and this is free, <laughs> you want to, and we actually do this test, we offer this uh, test within our book, you, you want to figure out what is your brand purpose. And 
uh, really think about what's your why? How are you going to be differentiated from the other businesses that you compete with? And how are you really connecting to the customer in a different way? And through that process of understanding what your impact is, understanding what is that, what's that kind of broader uh, meaning behind your brand and, and who it is that you're targeting and how are you delivering value to them, what you also will want to think about is what are those kind of humanistic qualities that would that would kind of match up with being able to deliver on that purpose and that's your brand personality and again you know where a lot of companies or businesses go wrong is that they look outward for the the development of their brand personality they might hire a really expensive consultant to come in and say well this is what your personality should be but really, as we talked about before, if you don't have an authentic brand personality and purpose that's connected to why your business exists and that gets operationalized and felt by the employees that are working at your business, then you're not going to come across authentically to your customers. So being able to go through that exercise of understanding your why and thinking about what are our brand values, what's gonna drive our business decision-making and then how can we create the experiences uh, throughout our uh, touch points with our customers so that they really feel the essence of what we stand for as a brand and how we're different from our competition uh, will really, I think, be what separates your brand from other competing businesses. That was a lot of really important data points to unpack, but you do, as you mentioned, you bring that, we break that down in your book really well. Um, but I know that is a point, like, you know, a lot of times it is like right at that beginning, even though it seems so basic where people they, they don't know exactly where to start because it can seem really overwhelming. And like you said, you bring in outsiders, but how do outsiders really know who you are? You'll never know quite exactly who you are. They'll have that perception of how you're coming off to them, right? Mm -hmm. But they're never going to exactly know from you what you're, yeah. Um, so this is an interesting one. Um, I do follow a lot of marketing because I do like a lot of the library, social media and email marketing. Um, in Northeast Ohio, there's this marketer, his name's Joe Polizzi. He does a lot of like discussions and things like that. Keynote conferences, written some books about content marketing. And he always like uh, most of his email newsletters that he sends out, he's always encouraging people to be really mindful anymore of what platforms are choosing, and especially with social media changes taking place this week. We now have Elon Musk, um, a new owner there. There's new stories about how Meta is not doing so great and the world of Facebook is stagnating. Um, he always really argues that people should be mindful of what platforms are putting their stuff on and move things if possible to platforms where you own because you control your voice completely. Do you necessarily agree with that um, or do you have a different take? I think there's there's an element of that that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, so the platforms are gonna be transient, they're gonna shift. Um, if your ways of interacting with customers is being mediated through uh, a third party, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, uh, whether it's Google ads and it's, it's SEO and it, it's through search, uh, then you uh, suffer from platform risk. And almost ironically, nobody knows that platform risk right now any more than Meta. So if we go back to our uh, 2007 story with this sort of birth of the new internet, you know, Apple, you know, not only became an incredibly successful $3 trillion brand, but they created a platform in mobile, in the iPhone. This is when Gmail was created. This is when Amazon created um, e-commerce and really went beyond just the book. Um, but Facebook created their platform that needs other platforms to get to their customers. So the way you access Facebook is either through mobile, Android, Samsung, uh, you know, Apple, whatever, iOS, or through uh, the internet through Chrome to Internet Explorer, and uh, because Apple essentially kneecapped them with uh, the, the sort of default option no longer being data tracking, that overnight just absolutely killed their business. And so they're moving to Meta one because uh, their primary business has, has really suffered because these other competitors, these other platforms, have really ganged up on them. Uh, but secondly, they're the only one of the big four. Uh, tech companies that didn't create their own platforms have always suffered from platform risk and they really need to create their own platform. And obviously it's very difficult to create your own platform. They're, they're putting all of their chips in the center with Meta, which uh, sort of a sidebar is just like the craziest rebranding ever. I mean, this would be as if, uh, you know, Apple in 2006, before they invent the iPhone, uh, renames their brand, which is a successful, well-known brand as Facebook's is, 
uh, they renamed their entire brand to Mobile. And it doesn't exist yet. It's a totally different category, but they want to rename their whole brand about an industry, about a product that doesn't exist. And that's exactly what uh, Meta is doing right now. So suffice to say, um, yeah, the, the platforms can shift. They can uh, either shut down, they can change their algorithm, and you're really, you're really susceptible as a marketer uh, to these platforms. And so you can see how uh, really owning the customer fundamentally is really, really important. So if all else fails, if all the social media platforms go away, there's still gonna be email and you're still gonna be able to reach them if you have their email, if you, uh, you know, are, are on the, a newsletter, you can still reach your uh, consumers. Um, if you have a, a domain, nobody owns the internet. And so you still have a domain in which consumers can find you. And this is where, uh, you know, some, some people get really excited about the future of the internet and web three that, you know, we're going to own small parts of the internet. And instead of this sort of transactional through these big sort of landlords, we're going to figure out this way of sort of a rental based internet where we own sort of different properties. And then we can decide who we rent from and, and who doesn't. And cryptocurrency comes in there at some point. I'm not the biggest web three bull. I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting, but I think it, it's a ways off, but you can see how web three enthusiasts might get excited thinking about this, this platform risk. So uh, yeah, long story long, I think um, the, the, uh, the local marketer um, has, has something to say there for sure. Can, can I just add to that quickly? I would also say for small businesses, there, there are smaller platforms that really do target certain communities based on your customer base. So I think we saw this with Shopify that came up against Amazon and Allbirds, which was once on Amazon and Amazon did the thing that they do to a lot of <laughs> small companies, which is they knocked off their products and tried to sell it for, for less. And Allbirds really did take this, a, a relatively big brand and moved to Shopify and said, you can find us here. And Shopify is one of those platforms that really does cater to the small business. Um, I actually am into health, wellness, mindfulness, those types of things. And I have other platforms that I access my yoga app or, you know, another uh, product or service um, on these circle.com and these other types of platforms that uh, allows communities of people who have similar interests to, to get together. So I think similar to what Matt was just saying, we're seeing this kind of democratization of platforms and uh and i don't think there's just the one or two or three options but we're seeing a lot more options for small businesses to put their products or services on platforms that are really targeting a specific niche customer yes and i mean we don't have to get to all that tonight because i mean you have an entire chapter developed on the, you know dedicated to what we're calling like the nano influencer like the really small micro fixated influencer but because they have such a small um target their group their followers are really into the product and it's much more sense of community and i think that's the thing we keep coming back to tonight over and over whether it's businesses doing well when the face of amazon or like um the marketing channels like you're saying like the smaller apps it's because it's not just the noise of like everybody and your brother on facebook posting stuff on your news feed instead it's very targeted of a community of people i think it really does um, say something to the role of community and branding. Definitely, definitely. I think that that's, you know, one area that, that really incredible brands are able to, to do is not just create incredible communication between the brand and consumer, but create communities where consumers engage in, uh, in like activities, they have sort of, you know, rituals around the product and they all sort of do it together. So you mentioned the, uh, the Jeep wedding being a great example of that, where you know Jeep doesn't ever on their website or any ad copy or anything say, you know, have a Jeep themed wedding. Uh, there's all of these you know incredible events that that come up organically all over the country and internationally, um, surrounded by by sort of Jeep enthusiast meetups, and that doesn't come from up high in terms of like Dodge Chrysler Jeep doesn't like tell consumers to do this but they've created such an incredible brand and they know that their products, you know, are, have a very practical uh, sort of purpose that, that sort of, you know, for outdoors people, weekend warriors, uh, their, their um, brand messaging has sort of encouraged that. And they sort of, you know, let the community, you know, sort of fly with it. And it'll, it'll bring us things like Jeep weddings in the process as well. So uh, yeah, more and more, I, I think brands are, are sort of leaning into this community creation. Absolutely. So we have time for a few um, audience questions. We do have some. Um, 
This is a little bit more of a practical one. So I guess we'll start with this. So someone wants to know, um, they are working out their brand statement and they're looking for some advice on what should you include in this brand statement? Um, they want to emphasize too that they're doing both B2B and B2C and they've actually been around for a long time, but I guess the branding part hasn't really been a focus until now. Yeah, so, so oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, it's really great that we got through 55 minutes before we talked over each other. <laughs> um, I, what I would suggest first is, um, is to really, again, start with the why. And if this business has been around for a long time, they, they probably understand why they exist and who it is that they're serving. But you really want to think about kind of the purpose statement of being why you exist, the values and the how you determine your business decisions is how are you gonna get there, right? So if you even think of it from a strategy perspective, your strategy or your goals that go out, you know, three to five years, but your tactics are those smaller steps that are gonna take you there over time, over the next one to two years. They're, they're closer, they're more near term. And so if you are trying to come up with that brand statement, first of all, I think be succinct, be concise. It doesn't have to be this robust, all-encompassing statement. I think the, the more concise and succinct you are, but you know, keep it kind of broad and just really think about what is the impact you want your brand to make on the customer and on the community, that that's a good place to start. And again, we have that why exercise in the book that really helps businesses think about how to get to that statement. But then it's also about what are our principles that we will have and how we conduct business and how we will connect with the consumer. And I almost feel like the principles in which we conduct our business will help you operationalize your brand and really think about how it is that you're interacting with the customer. What's your customer service like? And, and what, what kind of uh, value do we want to deliver to our customers, whether they're B2C or B2B? So that would be a good place to start. Um, Matt, what would you add? Yeah, so I think all that is is really, really excellent advice. I think um, really when it comes to, you know, the very sort of early uh, beginnings of, of the brand, uh, I think really, as, as Sessa says, really try to keep it as, as sort of simple and succinct as possible. Uh, we can get very sort of long, you know, documents and, and slide decks about our brand voice and, you know, all of these sort of expressions of the core brand. But I think really the core brand is, is sort of a deep focus at, at this stage. And I think it's really three things. It's sort of the core of the brand strategy, which is sort of, you know, what we do and who we do it for. So our value proposition and who is our target market, unless we're Amazon, unless we're Alibaba, we're not all things to all people or something very specific to a target market or a few different target markets, but nonetheless, we know who we do it for. And then uh, we also have to be at the same time, uh, really concerned at this point with differentiation. Um, so I, I think the core of differentiation, you can go down, you know, a much longer list, but it's really asking yourself the question, what do we do better than anybody else? So anybody else surveying, you know, the possible competitors, surveying the competitive landscape, what differentiates us? And if we can't do anything better than anybody else, then we better compete on price, we better compete on accessibility, we better compete on uh, other things sort of outside of some of the core competencies. And so I think, um, as I mentioned, sort of keeping it simple and then sort of keeping it to those uh, sort of three questions, I think is, is a good place to start. Wow, thank you so much. Um, now, obviously, I know your answer first is going to be for people looking for more information to read your book, whether you're picking it up from the local bookshop, right, or you're going and getting it from your local library. But because both of you are so immersed, both in teaching and the education and the research of this field, um, what is your number one go-to resource for that small business that's wanting to look for even more, whether it's media, classes, lectures, blog posts? What's your number one go-to that you would recommend for someone wanting to keep up on branding? It's a good question. So yeah, you, you definitely hit the, the nail on the head, Kelsey. Definitely the book would be, you know, place, place number one. Uh, number two, I think um, there, there really is so much out there now, which uh, is sort of democratized in terms of access to really, really good insights. And there's so many great uh, thought leaders and practitioners that, that just sort of put their insights up there on the web for everybody. And, and one person in particular that I'd really recommend, especially if the focus is on small businesses and brands, is the work of uh, Roger L. Martin, who is uh, UK based, but he applies these very sort of general uh, principles. He writes these very succinct, very easily accessible uh, blog posts, primarily on Medium, about 
branding strategy, about building a brand, about sort of starting from scratch. Uh, he's a really fantastic resource. So that's that's who I would put out there. And I would just add, I um, Matt, I know, has his website, um, which I'm sure he'll give. I do a podcast called Happy at Work. Um, it's the Happy at Work podcast. And we talk a lot about these issues as it re relates to workplace culture and how that intersects with how you interact with customers and your marketing function. Well, there we go. They both have their own platforms with more content <laughs> because trust me, you cannot stuff all of this into just a one hour conversation, right? I mean, there's just so much to unpack. So I just want to say thank you so much for this virtual conversation tonight, both Tessa and Matt. Thank you. Thank you to everybody else who joined us tonight. Um, is, do you have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to share or say? Just, just thank you. Uh, we, we've done a few different talks. Uh, this is our first with a library. Um, we're blessed in Boston to have some gorgeous libraries. I was just in the Boston Public Library, and it's just an incredible reminder. I mean, humans were, were capable of some pretty terrible things, terrible things happening in, in the world, and then you step foot in a library, and it's like, oh, yeah, like human civilization. Like, we're capable of some pretty amazing things. I think libraries are, are a fantastic testament to that. So thank you for everything you do, keeping this uh, civilizational uh, sort of norm alive. Uh, it's really fantastic. And I would just add that I am originally a Buckeye born in Delaware, Ohio. So really appreciate my parents and all my family in Ohio. We're very excited I was doing this event tonight. So thank you everyone for joining us. Well, again, thank you so much. Thank you to our entrepreneur community, you know, the library. We love both our authors as well as all of our users. So again, thank you and take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.